Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. I'm Dave, and I collect vintage Viewmaster reels. Each of these discs contains seven 3D pictures of a place that were taken over 50 years ago. I'm on a quest to visit these places and retake the pictures. Join me to see what they look like now and maybe learn some history along the way. This time, it's a Viewmaster favorite, the Grand Canyon. This was a popular topic for Viewmaster. I've got 27 different Grand Canyon reels to pick from, but for this episode, we're mostly looking at pictures from this three reel set numbered A361, dated from the mid 50s. This was our first trip to the Grand Canyon, so we were very excited. You obviously hear so much about the park and what it's like to visit that I was actually a little nervous. So I made sure to be prepared and did a lot of research online ahead of time. We were on our Route 66 road trip when we visited the Grand Canyon. The route runs along here, about an hour south of the canyon, and we decided to stay the night in Williams, the closest town to the park. Route 66 used to run right through Williams, and that stretch of road was the very last piece of the route to be bypassed by Interstate in 1984, effectively ending Route 66. We got into town in the afternoon and spent the rest of that day exploring. It's kind of a combination mountain town and Route 66 memorial. Lots of old neon signs, museums, vintage buildings, and a train station, which is still used today. Williams was founded in 1881 and named after William Old Bill Williams, who was a famous trapper and mountain man. It was built to support the railroad connecting St. Louis to San Francisco, and as we'll see later, to the Grand Canyon, giving thousands of visitors access to the park. We made an early night of it since we'd read that the park can get very crowded and it was best to get there early. So we got up at 7 the next morning and headed to our first target. Precipitous bluffs and lofty crags from Mather Point. It's an hour drive from Williams into the park, but we'd left early and bought our pass online, so it was easy to get in. Mather Point is over here, and the parking lot was still pretty empty. It was just a short walk out of the lot, and boom, we came right up to the canyon. It's actually kind of hard to describe the experience. Your brain can't really process what you're seeing. From the path, you can see there's an edge, but what's in front of you is so vast, such a void, so immeasurable, that it's not like anything you've ever experienced before. Here's a Rand McNally cross-country railway guide from 1888, saying that a detour by stagecoach to the canyon is worth it unless you were an invalid or a lady, and it describes two men seeing the canyon for the first time. They had gone to the edge of the canyon. One of them said, well, I'll be damned. The other had meantime seated himself upon a convenient boulder and was weeping like a broken-hearted girl. In the 1800s, most of the people living at the canyon were miners looking for copper or asbestos, although it soon became apparent that they could make more money guiding travelers into the canyon. And at the time, it was a 65-mile stagecoach ride from Flagstaff to get to the edge, and it required a couple days of overnight camping, making the visit something only a dedicated few might attempt. Even so, it was so popular that the local miners and stagecoach operators built a couple hotels right on the edge, the Bright Angel Hotel in 1896 and the Grand View in 1898. And at the same time, a railroad was laid from Williams to service the Anita Copper Mine, just here south of the canyon. But the line went bankrupt within a year, and it was purchased by the Santa Fe Railway Company. They saw the bigger picture and extended the line the final 15 miles to the edge of the canyon. Now travelers could reach the canyon from Williams in a couple hours instead of a couple days. The Grand Canyon tourism boom had begun. Yavapai Observation Point Yavapai Point is west from Mather Point. It's along a well-paved level pathway that's an easy 20-minute walk. 
There's a museum at the point with exhibits on the canyon geology, and we spent a little time learning about the canyon. It all started over two billion years ago, when the earth was only half as old as it is now. Layer upon layer of mud, sea life, plants, animals, and debris piled up, wore away, and piled up again, creating rock formations thousands of feet deep, a hidden record of the history of our planet. And then, about 60 million years ago, the entire area, the Colorado Plateau, which is here, started to push up as the Rocky Mountains formed, rising up about a mile, creating a continent-wide ramp leading to the coast. Rainfall and snow melt from the mountains started to pour down this ramp, eventually forming the Colorado River, and the river carried silt and mud with it to the ocean. How much silt and mud? Glad you asked. The river would carry about 80,000 truckloads of dirt away per day, every day, 365 days a year, for five or six million years. And where did all that dirt go? It dumped out here, filling the entire northern end of the Gulf of California, creating one of the most fertile valleys in North America. And at this end of the valley is the Salton Sea, water that's trapped in a basin, blocked by 175 trillion truckloads of dirt left by the Colorado River. All that moving dirt and rock carved a deep gash into the uplifted ground, cutting all the way down to the bottom, revealing all the layers of rock back down to those that formed almost 2 billion years ago. Hopi House Further along the canyon edge is Hopi House, which is in the Grand Canyon Village. This building looks ancient, but it's actually kind of modern. It's basically the canyon gift shop. Understanding what we're looking at takes a bit more history. In 1903, President Roosevelt rode the train to visit the canyon. He was pretty impressed, as you'd expect, and said, I hope you will not have a building of any kind, not a summer cottage, a hotel, or anything else, to mar the wonderful grandeur of the canyon. Leave it as it is. But the Santa Fe Railroad Company were well underway with their plan to build a grand hotel at the end of their railway right on the rim of the canyon. They opened the El Tovar Hotel in 1905, just two years after Roosevelt asked not to build anything there. The hotel was one of the country's first destination resorts, really high-end for its time, and twice as large as originally planned. The railroad put the hotel under the control of the Fred Harvey Company, which we've come across a few times now in these videos, making it one of the most popular of the Harvey houses. Fred Harvey had had great success selling souvenirs at the Indian building at the Alvarado train station in Albuquerque. So he asked the woman who decorated that store to build a much larger version of it at the Grand Canyon. That woman was Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter, a designer and architect's apprentice who'd done the designs in Albuquerque as a summer job and now had the opportunity to design an entire building at the Grand Canyon. Her Grand Canyon gift shop was a replica of an actual Hopi Pueblo in Arizona, built using historically accurate designs and materials, decorated with native artifacts and artwork. She combined commerce with historic preservation, bringing aspects of Pueblo life to the tourists as they shopped. Meanwhile, all this new development was worrying President Roosevelt. Would the race to capture tourists' dollars ruin the beauty of the area? In 1906, Congress passed the Antiquities Act to help protect historic sites, and it was just what Roosevelt needed. He stretched the definition of monument about as far as you could and declared the entire 818,560-acre area a single national monument in 1908. This put the government, specifically the Forest Service, in control of the Grand Canyon. Its fate was in their hands. There will be more on Architect Mary Coulter later, but for now, here's our next stop. Overhanging Rock on Hopi Point Ow. 
We ate a great lunch at the El Tovar restaurant and then took the shuttle bus to Hopi Point. Looking online, I couldn't find any reference to overhanging rock as something at the Grand Canyon, so we carefully walked along the ridge looking for this particular double layer sticking out rock and eventually found exactly the right one. And here's where the Viewmaster photographer was braver than I was. This picture was pretty easy to replicate, although looking out over the edge is legitimately freaky. But this alternate one from below the ridge would have meant climbing down here to the very edge of the cliff to get the shot. It's a great picture, especially in 3D, and it was used for the cover of the packet and eventually replaced the red jacket guy on later reels. We explored this side of the canyon a while longer, and then we took the shuttle back to our car and started driving east along Desert View Drive to Duck on the Rock has seen the story of the ages. This viewpoint isn't marked on the map, but looking it up online, we found the mile marker for the turnout. It's a rock that kind of looks like a duck. There's not much more to say about it, so here's something interesting. The Grand Canyon was promoted from National Monument to National Park in 1919, and this meant transferring control from the Forest Service to the newly formed National Park Service. The Park Service realized they'd inherited a serious problem, a canyon, which has two sides. Their offices were on the south side, but more and more people were visiting the north side as well as the ranch on the river, now named after President Roosevelt. Sending a communication from one side to the other meant a 25-mile-long mule ride. Not ideal. A phone line was needed. A copper wire was strung across trees and rocks for the entire 25-mile length from one side to the other, taking six months. But this line could only handle one phone conversation at a time, and almost immediately, the line needed a costly upgrade. Another Roosevelt to the rescue, this time Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who authorized the Civilian Conservation Corps in the midst of the Great Depression to put unemployed people to work on useful projects. And one of those projects was upgrading the entire Trans Canyon phone line, which took almost a full year, completing it in the fall of 1935. It was used until the 1980s when microwave transmitters replaced it, but even today some parts of it are still used, making it one of the nation's last original copper wire phone lines still in use. We left the Duck Rock and continued on to... 7 to 9 million year old chasm from Lipan Point. This road is longer than you'd expect, going along the edge east of the village area. You pass the Grandview Point, which is where the original Stagecoach Road led and where the early Grandview Hotel was, and eventually get to this elevated vista point. This view of the canyon lets you see all the geological layers representing billions of years. Let's learn a bit more about how these layers formed. Two billion years ago, sediment and volcanic ash accumulated in layers thousands of feet thick. Underground magma pushed upwards, forming folded mountain ranges. The tops of these mountains eroded away, leaving the folded rocks beneath. Then the land was repeatedly submerged under shallow water, depositing 12,000 feet of sediment that contained historical clues like plant fossils, stone ripple marks, and fossilized animal tracks. As the Earth's tectonic plates collided, land was pushed upwards, creating fault block mountains. Those mountains eroded away, leaving only their tilted bases behind, and then the land was submerged beneath the ocean. 
The bulk of what we see in the canyon formed at this time, as an additional 4,000 feet of sediment accumulated, including clues to the sea life that lived at the time, like trilobite fossils and tube worm trails. Four to 8,000 more feet of layers accumulated, but the plateau also started raising up, so these layers were mostly washed away, leaving only a few mesas behind. The river relentlessly cut through all these layers, creating the canyon we see today. And from here, we continued along Desert View Drive to see the Watchtower at Desert View. The Watchtower is one of the iconic images you see related to the Grand Canyon. It's just near the eastern entrance with lots of parking nearby. And again, it looks pretty ancient, but again, it's not true. It's another Mary Coulter Fred Harvey Museum and Gift Shop built in 1932. The date confused me though. At this point, the Grand Canyon was a protected national park. So why was the Fred Harvey Company allowed to build a new gift shop on property? It all really stems from the explosive growth of tourism after the train came to the canyon. The Forest Department's skill set was really land management. They did really well dealing with the miners who'd become tour guides, but they left all the tourism management to the Santa Fe Railway and the Fred Harvey Company. Those companies focused on the railway, restaurants, and hotels, but as the 20s approached, the automobile couldn't be ignored anymore, and it was clear that significant improvements to park infrastructure were required. A single government agency was needed to manage all national parks and monuments properly, and in 1916, the National Park Service was created. They took over the Grand Canyon from the Forestry Service and inherited all the problems. In order to focus properly on park infrastructure, they officially granted the Fred Harvey Company a contract to handle the tourism side of things. This gave the company unique authority to add new facilities to the national park, and even today, the company that bought out Fred Harvey, Zantera, still runs them. The building itself has the same sense of authenticity as the Hopi House, but in reality is a modern steel framed building. Inside are circular balconies covered with native artwork, made from logs salvaged from the original Desert View Hotel, and large windows to observe the canyon. And now it's finally time to talk a little bit more about the architect, Mary Coulter, whose influence on the American Southwest had become really clear. We already saw her work at the Hopi House and this watchtower, and she designed two more buildings at the Grand Canyon, the Lookout Studio and Hermit's Rest. She went on to design many more buildings for the Fred Harvey Company over the next 38 years. She was the one who designed the revisions to the Painted Desert Inn we saw last episode, and parts of La Fonda we'd seen in Santa Fe. And just before starting work on the Watchtower, she completed what many consider her masterpiece, La Posada Hotel in Winslow, Arizona. La Posada closed in 1957 and was abandoned to be torn down. When she heard the news, Coulter said, there's such a thing as living too long, and she died the next year. Luckily for us, La Posada wasn't demolished. It's been saved and restored, and we visited it on this trip. Eating lunch in the old Harvey house as people waited for the incoming train really transported us back in time, making all this history come alive. And that was the last picture we were looking for. Other than it being awesome, the main thing that struck me about the Grand Canyon was how easy it was to visit. It's a national treasure, available for everyone to see, and credit needs to go to the Park Service for a hundred years of hard work in making it so. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.